Welcome back everyone to part two on Zero Trust and Identity on CyberTalk with Nikolai and today we have a lot of excitement to talk and a little bit of technical stuff to dive into. One question I would say, Sharok, if you can describe a little bit how would technology that you developed would help people to eliminate all those things? Because I know everyone is trying to make it frictionless and that's the key of the game. The better you do it, the greater acceptance you're going to have and everyone sort of win-win. But security is not always about, you know, making it everything frictionless, but sometimes we introduce a lot of friction just to achieve the goal we want to achieve. But in this case, I think the goal should be as frictionless as possible and as secure and as uh, autonomous as possible as well. I, I think that actually what I like to do is share this um, some graphics with you and kind of walk you through why this yeah. is this is such a intuitive and simple thing when once you once you see the simple graph the the viewpoint is very simple it's is authentication in general we have been dealing with it and um, going into the entrance to the zero trust is because we only think about it as a single event most of the time. But as I mentioned, as, and, and also you mentioned earlier, the zero trust is not just an event or, or a single set of technology. It's a continuation. So if you divide the, the whole zero trust platform and you tie that to identity and authentication, you need to take a look at how we look at authentication as a continuum versus a single event. Continuum means from the moment that you start your digital journey. How would you start your digital journey? All the way to the left, you, you start your digital journey either by logging into the um, asset uh, by a device or a browser or a, through a VDI. And sometimes you do a VPN after you have done that. And that's before you authenticate your claim ident identity. So before, when you see in the center that how most organizations treat the legacy solutions, they treat this um, entrance to, uh, to their zero trust framework, which is the identity and identity proofing and, and um, authentication, they always start with how to strengthen the password, how to do MFA, how to do XFA. No, really the approach that we have had is go as far left as we can and take a look at the port of entry, the, the, the engagement with your digital life. How does it start? So device, mobile or the desktop or workstation or whatever, the browser, then after that is the network, the VPN, and then the applications, whether it is a VDI or a, or a, um, uh, ZTNA or, or some sort of um, um, uh, network access that needs to establish that root of trust and that trust chain. Then when it comes to authentication, it needs to be a system that is dynamically calculating the risk, recognizing the people who are claiming the identity and mapping them to the ports of entries that they have historically have come in. And using both context and behavior to measure the amount of risk. And then right here, the most important thing is post authorization. Because from the get go, we our viewpoint was that all evil, all, everything starts with identity, and then all evil happens post authorization. Because it doesn't matter who has access to your account, is what they do with it, right? I always bring this example. Your, your financial institution, the tellers at the bank, your most likely your spouse or, or your significant other, and sometimes even your children have access to your bank account. But it is what they do with that knowledge and access to the bank account and how you can get early warnings when they're in and take insightful actions in real time is important. And that's why the third piece of this diagram is very important. Now, what, is the, what does that entail? Actually, if you think about it, I have a diagram that, I'll, I'll, uh, that you can see here. It's actually in order to do pre-auth, at-auth, and post-authorization, checking of the identity, it's, it's very straightforward. What do you need? First, you need to have a source of truth, right? Which means that you need to know what this identity 
is coming from, what group do they use, they, they are part of, and what type of privileges of access and control applies to them. That's why what we did was we built a platform that integrates with all of the identity stores um, from um, Azure to traditional AD to um, you know um, Oracle and and whatnot, any type of um, data data store uh, identity storages we we connect to. So once you do that, now you have a source of truth. Then the next thing was well, most of our customers they either are looking for a new um, IDP or an SSO, or they already have it. So we basically built a system that is interoperable. And this is a very key topic for our CISOs. You can't just unplug and, and replace, rip and replace something. You need to collaborate. And most of CISOs are frustrated with how the industry is competing. And there's diamond dozen IDP providers, but they don't work and collaborate with each other to secure the enterprise platform. So what we have done is we have built a platform that is modular and interoperable that, that the enterprise has done. Devices and the nice level predict at the perimeter. And when I call perimeter, I mean at the edge of the network, on the browser, on the device, on the mobile, and at the same time triangulating it together. So those three pieces are the fundamental pieces that any organization needs to have in order to be able to deliver the pre-auth and at-auth authentication. Now, obviously, you need to have some sort of interoperability and, and XFA, I call it, instead of MFA, um, where you can dial the contrast on the risk and the level of, or call it level of assurance, and assert some sort of out-of-band um, XFA uh, initi uh, initiation where you can actually grab the attention of the user and say, hey, Nikolai, we think it is you, but we have doubts. And for that reason, we are going to do a step-up authentication. And that's what you see at 9 o'clock in this diagram, all of it feeding into the risk engine and the policy orchestration. And now the question is, how do we do post-authorization? Post-authorization is an amazing um, activity that actually um, that allows us to, to interoperate and have these building blocks to be um, uh, modular and plug and play, and the, the ability to detect anomalies by ingesting data from the enterprise SIM, from their UBA or our own UBA, um, and then apply it to the um, AIML um, risk analyzers. Now what we can do is we can not only be a observer like the SIM is or the UBA is, but actually take a real-time insightful action and do it. Now, what is missing in this diagram that I'm sharing with you is the piece about identity proofing because we start at the top saying that there is a source of truth and everything else. There, there needs to be also a module on the onboarding piece, which actually we do have, but not we don't do it directly ourselves. We actually collaborate with top um, uh, providers of identity proofing from Accuant to FaceFee to, um, to Jumio and others, where we actually even enable as an authenticator, the identity proofing, the physical identity proofing of the individuals as a module of our platform. But the key thing, as you can see from the title, the solution that CISOs are looking for is a modular and an interoperable platform. Sounds great, Sharon. So from that point, yeah, it's a definitely interesting slide and interesting conversation about this uh, identity proofing and uh, where we're going. So one question came up to my mind and I said, uh, well, what role password is going to be playing once we make this transition? We came to trust passwords for the past probably 50 years or so. Are they going to stay with us? Or when we move to zero trust, do you see passwords staying with us or not? So this is a very interesting uh, passwordless is the fashionable thing everybody is marching towards it. Back in 2016, when the company that is now part of Secure Auth, Accepto, and is branded as Arculix, uh, when we started our journey on pitching that that everything is going to be passwordless going forward, th there is 
a fiction versus a reality uh, associated with passwords. Look, passwords, as long as AD exists, will continue to exist. And it is, whether you call it a password, a pin, a passphrase, or even if you go to all of us who claim and report that we are passwordless, it is a certificate. At the end of the day, it is an entity that is stored at some place and it is being compared against. The point is not only going to passwordless, but making passwords benign, meaning that if someone even has your certificate, uh, you have seen the last this year's number of breaches that has happened to all of our uh, partners and some of our competitors and everything else. And it, 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 you can see that neither the MFA nor the certificates nor the all of these things. And you remember from last year, solar wind stuff and everything else. This is not about the fact that we say, oh, if I if I go passwordless now, I'm protected. Password is the one of your entry points or validations of the claim identity. If it gets replaced by a token, by a phone, by an RFID card, by some XFA, multiple factors, um, and I always say that I hate factor sequencing because of the fact that factor sequencing eventually will get you locked up. And unfortunately, some people talk about factor sequencing um, from from the um, not not knowledge of how many times you can get locked out when you have ten or eleven factors, even three factors. You need to have an effective factor based on risk. Can we go passwordless? Hundred percent. Can do I expect that in the next 10 years, the market is going to go passwordless 90%? No. The reality is for the next decade, we are going to inch our way towards replacing passwords with other factors, XFAs, that provide us a higher efficiency in authenticating the claim identity. At the same time, they are less vulnerable and themselves individually they are benign even if they get breached imagine if i had a token heart token or if i had a, um, even a heart token plus biometric and on top of it i i had um, a certificate um, now each one of them are vulnerable they have different threat um, surface and they can get breached but the point is go i take you back to my point about it needs to be continuous authentication. Assume that all of your claim identities are breached and assume that there is an account takeover in the play. What are you gonna do then? Can you detect it? And more important, after you detect it, can you take an insightful action to usher the person who has taken over your account to the front door and leave them there locked out? Got it. I don't know if that kind of uh, that. doesn't disappoint you that uh, I say that, yes, there is password. Of course, there is the journey towards passwordless. But uh, unfortunately, till our master and commander, Microsoft exists and AD exists, and you know how slow we are in the IT yeah. world, it's going to be a while before we are 100% passwordless. But our company provides passwordless um, and the context of passwordless for both enterprise and for Siam consumer facing, hundred percent, we we got it. Got it. No, thank you, Shavak, for that. And I think you touched really extremely valuable point and important one when we talked about passwords. So they may not go away, but they're not going to be primary factor for somebody to use to get authenticated and identified to the system, which is what we have right now. The moment you start getting into something, first thing you need to provide password versus in your terms what you describe and with technologies that you use that may be still a factor somewhere, but it's not the primary factor or significant factor that someone has to always rely upon. And I think that's uh, I'm aligned in the same vision that the transition will take place at some point and uh, people will still have the convenience of not having password, but they still have passwords in some cases that they would need to either prove their identity or as additional factor that they may be prompted for whatever reason that technology doesn't recognize them as who they are and they need to provide additional proof in that they should be right. entitled right. to login. Yeah, right. no, definitely. 
And I think that the whole notion of uh, relying on devices, relying on your SIM card, relying on analytics mostly, and, and the data science part and data engineering part of the future of cybersecurity is significant. If you take a look at what we have been doing for the last six decades, um, the financial industry is ahead of us when it comes to financial transactions and fraud. If you treat IT and access management and zero trust the same way that we, uh, the financial institutions treat fraud, then you can actually um, recognize and ap- appreciate the level of importance that analytics and data science and data engineering plays in the future for, for delivering this promise of continuous authentication and making passwords or any type of replacement of them, whether it's phone as a token or whether it is a certificate et cetera, et cetera, how, how it can actually protect us all. Hey, Shabok, on your opinion, let's say when we go into on that route, how difficult is going to make for people to fall for social engineering and for the CISOs to protect against that uh, potential threat vector? Because right now, anytime you read some bridge happen here and there, at the root of this bridge, it was somebody gave up credentials and uh, the company got compromised because of that social engineering was used. So going into the future, how would that play out? Will it still be significant factor or essentially social engineering will probably take some different uh, form of getting people compromised because right now, again, like 82% of all the things that are happening and money being lost is through social engineering. How do you see this uh, technology assisting it or helping people once they get into zero trust? The, the analog to the social engineering is, is when you have a side door on your garage that has a glass window. It's a glass door on the side of your garage. And you think that you by adding locks and padlocks and everything else and control on your garage and having cameras all over the house, everything is okay, but there is a side door in this case, which can be easily with a, with a small hard surface, you can break the glass and unlock the door and go in. In order to prevent social engineering, there is one core low hanging fruit, and that is the help desk and the call centers need to apply the concept of zero trust as well. For the last 30 years, we have been relying on things that back then because of the not having internet it was it was not easy to find but if the person that is on the call asks you what what was your uh, last address when you lived in washington dc that is a very easily discoverable item about almost anybody who's worth hacking right so social engineering is required Breaking away from the, so, the weakness of social engineering of uh, taking over accounts requires the low hanging fruit on it is to get these help desk and call centers to abandon the historical techniques and methods that for decades our uh, companies have been selling and they are easily hackable. This whole concept of KBA and um, the whole concept of what is your secret question and what was the name of your first dog or whether what um, color is your favorite color and what is your favorite meal and et cetera, et cetera, or even your social security, even the full social security, right? Number, these things needs to go away. When the help desk is get called or the call center gets called, you need to give them the analytics tools to detect whether this person is calling from where. A lot of people are relying on voice and, and whatnot. I want to tell you that as perhaps one of the easiest things to crack is just, unfortunately, people, it's, it's not only one piece of data that you need to compare. You need to compare where the call is coming from, what type of out of band you're going to have in order to prove. If you call to a call center and they ask you five questions and they let you in, you, um, you, you need to scratch your head and consider that, oh, this was an easy one. Anybody can, can answer those questions. And, and it's just funny that we are still relying on it. So going back to what is the solution? Number one question, is social engine, is there a fix for the social engineering? 
Um, yes, the fix is you treat the call centers as the weakest link of your zero trust platform today because they are truly the weakest link. Anybody can call, and since there's a human interaction, and say, I am sure Akshay is it. And for that reason, you need to apply the same rigor that you apply to um, the, the help desk and the uh, call centers. You need to apply the same rigor as someone who would call, who would log in to log into your account, which means that you need to be, make it an, uh, analytics driven. You need to make it multi-factor. You need to make it adaptive. At the same time, the same problem that exists in our digital life, it needs to be certain level of friction that doesn't frustrate the hell out of the, the legitimate caller. On the other hand, if the legitimate caller sees that there is a rigor into this system, they won't get frustrated because they feel secure and safe because of the rigor that we have put in. So can we, can we get rid of the social engineering? Yes, if we treat the help desk and the channels of the account recovery through the same rigor that we have. For example, we have a SIM swap detection policy that uh, at SecureAuth we detect SIM swaps, which is a which is a very strong attack uh, against uh, a, a executive or or a, a focused person that uh, of of interest person of interest that uh, we can actually detect and protect against. So these are the type of solutions that we need to go after. Got it, got it. All right. Thank you, Sharo. Appreciate it. And it seems like we're coming up to our time and I would love to spend another hour talking about them. That's fascinating and definitely interesting subject for everyone to know and learn uh, on their journey to zero trust. So I, one question I would like to ask you before we wrap up the show is like, is there anything else that we haven't mentioned today that you would like to share with the audience in their journey in zero trust? And, because to me, it's like identity is given. So you have to figure out how to perfect it and make it work. And then you start drilling down into other pieces of your architecture and how to take applications and everything else out of this hard shell and make it accessible only to people at the right time. But from your experience, and you've been, what, six plus years now trying to instill this idea that certain things now work in a certain way and uh, you build the whole application around i would say you started with zero trust because you didn't trust passwords and you tried to build around identity to make sure that identity is trusted and then you can gain the access where you need to go so is there anything else you would like to share with the audience before we wrap up i i think that i like to actually re put a request out there to all the CISOs every executive director or, or the IT manager that is out there. It, it starts with raising the bar to the status quo that the analysts and the market have programmed us to listen to and, and meet that minimum bar. I think that my request to the audience is to think about what is the next generation authentication looks like and what are the things that I need to have in this transformation towards that next gen? And set your expectation with your vendors on three things. What is your roadmap look like? And what are you doing to protect me in, in six months from now, 12 months from now, and then 18 months from now? And that itself prompts the, the need for innovation in this old, tired platform we call access management and it requires that all of us vendors to think about the second thing that i lobby and i request is that when if, when you look at your vendors take a look at the not only the innovation piece but also how they collaborate with each other there, there was a wall street journal article that was written by a few of the CISOs, and and i will later on send you the link. I, I highly recommend everyone to read this. There is a dime a dozen vendors that they do exact same thing. The key thing here is by sit, rising the, rising, you know, raising the bar for, uh, uh, for all of us uh, solution providers is what are you doing to collaborate with each other? And the core of this article was, there's so many people that they compete 
there's not that many people that they collaborate. And this goes back to my earlier slide about interoperability and ability to make one plus one at least greater than two. We spend significant amount of money in IT on duplicate solutions that the efficacy of them are all lacking even to the minimum that this day and age is required to, to meet the zero trust requirement. The third request or suggestion that I have to um, my peer CISOs and executive directors of IT is the ability to, to look at zero trust with an angle of data engineering and data science. What can you do with the existing assets that you have in order to ingest the data and make insightful actions with your existing deployments that you have? You don't, you don't, I'm not inviting you to come and buy secure auth product because we're a leader in this um, interoperability and the data science side. Actually take a look at what is, what can you do with the existing stack? And then take advantage of basically refinance the technical debt that you have already and you're spending anything between 10 million or if you're some large top five banks, you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars with all of these tools. What can you do with the existing assets to take advantage of the data engineering and data science of the, all of these assets to detect and recognize and take an insightful action? Once you do that you're, and put that as a concerted effort for the next 12 months of your organization, you automatically have crossed the chasm of um, doing the status quo. And any time that you need any help, obviously Secure Auth and myself um, and, and also many of our CISO friends uh, outside the business of Secure Auth are, are more than excited and happy to consult with you as, as peers with you when when you watch this video just google me i'm a very public all of my information is on the web so uh, yes you can social engineer me it's a number of my accounts as well all but, right yeah let uh, reach out to your existing assets see what you can do and then see what you can how you can refinance the technical debt that you already have um and and uh, see how we can help you as a community. Definitely. Thank you, Sharak, for those thoughts. And uh, like I always said, in cybersecurity, I can spend any money somebody can give me and still won't be enough. So there is plenty and you touched upon extremely important subjects there. So I think with that said, I certainly appreciate you coming on on the show and uh, sharing all your thoughts and explaining the technology behind and uh, taking us through the journey on zero trust and identity. So thank you, Sharak. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And audience, thank you, audience. Yeah. And to the audience, thank you for continuously tuning in and listening to what we have to say and uh, watch our show. So just remember, we're doing it for you and for everyone else. Security, it's a collective enterprise and we cannot win this alone. So we're stronger together. Thank you. Thank you.